Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Build Value by Choice. I'm your host, Nana Bonsu, President and CEO of Infinite Horizons Incorporated, where we help business owners increase the value of their business without increasing costs or their personal time in it. Our website is www.infhorizons.com. Uh, check us out and schedule an appointment to see how we can help you. Please don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review on our channel wherever you listen or watch. Now on to today's guest. Our guest today is Alison Batlapier. I'm sorry, Alicia Batlapier. Alicia is the founder and CEO of Equilibria Incorporated, which is a 15 year old operations management firm. She specializes in increasing bandwidth for fast growing companies via business infrastructure. Alicia has a BS in chemical engineering from Louisiana State University, an MBA from Tulane, and a Lean Six Sigma, see Six Sigma Black Belt uh, certification. Combined, her content has reached over three quarters of a million views across various online platforms. She hosts a weekly business infrastructure show, and she's also a two times Amazon bestseller publishing author. Alicia is an adjunct instructor at Purdue University, and she's a chemical engineer turned entrepreneur where she's advised design and optimized processes for organizations, including Coca-Cola, Shell, the Home Depot, and the Library of Congress. Welcome to the show, Alicia. Thank you so much, Nana. How are you doing? Oh, man, it's just, I think I'm just kind of, uh, it's a long day. I'm I like, know. <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. It's been a very, very long day. Oh, my God. But we're here. We and, are uh, here and we're going to we're going to have an amazing interview. Yeah, exactly. And you know what? This is this is actually a good one because processes and optimizing processes is what helps businesses scale and businesses when they scale they're able to maximize value in their business. So this is a very important thing and and obviously I, I love your background because we share some of background. I also <laughs> majored in chemical engineering and did an MBA, so it seems like uh we are uh, you know, we, we come from the same tribe. So that's uh, absolutely we're kindred spirits. For exactly. Sure. <laughs> exactly. Um, so if you can tell us a little bit just by way of introduction, uh, Equilibria, what is it? And uh, you know, how did you come to found it? And what are you about? Sure. Well, I started Equilibria. It, it was actually 17 years ago, back in 2005. And it is an operations management consulting firm. And we specialize in creating business infrastructure for fast growing small businesses. And it's it has morphed and evolved over the years, Nana, into what it is today. We now have the ability to work with businesses all around the world, thanks to all of the amazing digital technologies that are out there that make it very easy for us to conduct business without borders. And it, it's, it's a blast. We also have a podcast. We have an online course. We have a book. There's many different ways that we make the information concerning business infrastructure accessible to entrepreneurs around the world. Now, business infrastructure is not a term that is used around a lot. Why do you specifically choose uh, the term infrastructure? Is that something that you've kind of branded? And how do you differentiate that from like, you know, business process or some of the regular, um, you know, phrases or jargon that's used out there. You're, you're absolutely right. Business infrastructure, you know, as, as fellow business owners, we're always taught to differentiate ourselves in the marketplace. How can you stand out from the crowd? And I worked with a marketing consultant many years ago, Nana. This was back in, I believe, about 2006 or 2007. And this marketing consultant that I worked with at the time, she said, you know, Alicia, you're, you're really providing a business infrastructure for the companies that you're working with. And that term just stuck. And I always say that it's a blessing and it's a curse. It's a blessing in the sense that there are not a lot of people out there who talk about business infrastructure. So there isn't a lot of quote unquote, competition in that space. But it's also a curse in the sense that people don't know about it. They don't, therefore they don't know to go searching for it. That's why I'm so grateful to you for inviting me onto your show and, and helping give a platform 
where we can talk about business infrastructure, what it is, why it matters, and why every business, regardless of size or industry, should have it. Right. So you know, every industry has it. So let's let's talk about you know, let's sort of, you know, let's define uh, exactly what business infrastructure is and why that is important. Sure. Business infrastructure is a system for linking your people, your processes, and your tools and or technologies, linking all of those elements together so that you can build a foundation upon which you can scale in a repeatable, sustainable, and profitable way. There's so many different services and products that I see out there talking about, oh, we look at your people, your processes, and your tools, but the business infrastructure really is looking at every single one of those elements, the things that are required to operate your business on a daily basis, and how do you link them together such that when there's a change in one aspect or one element, you understand the impact that it will have on all of the others. So nothing is done in isolation with of understanding what it's going to do to all of the other parts that make up the whole. Now you use the term, another term that I've, I've, I've heard you use is the smooth and hassle-free workflow. How does that get orchestrated in the business infrastructure? Wow, there's a there's a process that we have for getting to processes, Nana. Mm. And and truthfully, it starts with these very simple exercises. And this may insult your intelligence because I know you're you're a really smart person, but but these tools are really effective. I use simple things like index cards. Uh, I haven't. I'm holding up an index card now. Yep, for and the people that are listening, yeah. That are listening, yes. Yeah. And stick figures. And with these two tools alone, we can help people identify first the different tasks or activities that need to be performed in the business, no matter how complex or how mundane. We then figure out how to group similar tasks together mm -hmm. into departments. And then once we understand what the tasks are for each department, we're then in a position to be able to identify the ideal people who should perform those different tasks and activities. And from there, once we know the tasks, the departments, the people who perform the tasks within the departments, that's when we're in an even better position to understand what processes need to be captured. That's what I mean, that, that's the start of creating smooth and hassle-free workflows. You have to first, some people just, they just start documenting <laughs> without mm. giving real thought to what they're documenting, why they're documenting it, and probably most importantly, who are you documenting these workflows for? Who is your audience for those workflows? Yeah, so I mean, I mean, I think what you're talking about, because it's different from you go and you interview the subject matter experts or the owner and capturing what they do and just you know, documenting them and say, hey, you've, you've created a system versus you walk the process and then you identify where there are redundancies or things that can be cut out, right? So you optimize, you lean that out. And then based on that, then you, then, you, know, you identify the task owners and, and what needs to be captured as part of the you know, primary value stream. Um, so I guess you're incorporating some Lean Six Sigma concepts in there, yes. among other things. Okay. In, indeed, indeed. And, and to your point, you want to reduce the variation. And I know for, for people who may not be familiar with what you and I used to do as chemical engineers, it's all about process. It's all about having a standard way of making product, for example. A, a, you know, in our case, we're dealing with chemicals. But the, but the concepts remain the same. How can you standardize what you do and how you do it such that whether I perform that process, Nana performs that process or someone else, the results within reason are consistent. That is what your customers are looking for. If they have a good experience with you and your company and your products and your services, they expect to have that experience every single time they do business with you. How do you ensure that? Through process. Yeah. Um, 
And so when you walk in the process, do you start from outside in or inside out? Meaning, do you start from you know, the customer when the you know, customer's first point of contact with the organization, or do you start from where do you start when you where do you start when you that is that is another really great question. And this is something that we talk about often in the lean principles course that I teach at Purdue. Every process starts with the customer. Now, when we say customer, your customer could be someone else within your company. Mm -hmm. So customers can be internal or external, but you always start with the customer because everything that you do has to be of benefit and value to your customer. If you are doing activities that absolutely add no value, you need to eliminate those right now. It's only going to cause harm and detriment to your day-to-day -day operations, and it, it erodes efficiency. But if you're looking at everything from the lens of, is this ultimately adding or providing value, or is this contributing to the valuable experience that my customer has come to expect from me, then that's certainly something that you want to keep. But processes should always begin with a customer triggering that process. And what I mean by that is it could be a customer placing an order online. That is a trigger point that actually starts, let's say, for example, your order to delivery process. Or if we're talking about healthcare, patients are the customers. So the minute a patient walks into an urgent care center or a hospital or a doctor's office, that patient has initiated a particular process for receiving care until the moment that that patient is discharged. Same thing with restaurants. The moment a customer comes into your restaurant and, and again, places an order for food, for some meal, what does that entire process look like from the moment that customer places the order to the moment that that customer receives his or her meal and pays the, the tab and, and goes home and you know do you follow up with asking them to leave a review that's what that's what we mean when we say process and the customer triggering whatever process you're about to document so you know the benefits you know based on what you just said you get consistent customer experience which makes the customer happy which makes them more likely to buy from you again and again which makes them more likely to refer you or recommend you to somebody else which increases your profits. It also reduces your costs because you're leaning out, you're cutting out unnecessary kind of things. What about the employees? Are the, are the employees happier or not happy? Because there's one or two ways to go about this, uh, to think about this. One is for the creatives, right? They like to be able to, they like the variation, right? Um, and so when you standardize it, they feel like you know, the, you know, the, you know, the ability to create is kind of taken away from them. Um, but from the business perspective, you know, from the business perspective, it's, it reduces the variation, meaning that the, the, you know, the user error going from one person to the next, right, um, you know, is reduced. And the other thing is, in terms of talent acquisition, you don't have to go and compete with larger businesses with the best of the best. You can pretty much, you know, bring in some you know, minimally qualified, you know, you know, people for the job and just kind of train them up using the standard document and processes. Is that correct? That is, that is correct. When you have done a really good job of capturing how to do something at the most basic, simplest level, you're absolutely right. You can bring in, you might be able to bring in some college students and train them via an internship that you create at your company and get them in at that ground level and just continue to train them and invest in their, their continuous education so that they can continue to grow with you and, and move up the ladder that you may establish within your company. You, you also mentioned another great point, which is you were talking about employees and, and how does this make the employees feel? Are they happier? It's so important to, you, ha you have to handle this very delicately, especially if you already have people on your team and you're talking about putting in place a business infrastructure. It's human nature for people to begin to feel threatened. If you start asking them to capture what they do and how they do it, 
it's I, I can guarantee you they're going to think that you're either about to replace them, that they're getting fired, that they'll be replaced by a robot, some some level of automation, for example. Mm -hmm. It can make people feel very uneasy. The way to work around that is to get them involved from the very beginning. So if, for those of you who are listening or watching us right now, if you already have people on your team and you are starting to consider documenting some of your key processes, get people, those people on your team involved in those activities. Let them know this is not about taking your job away from you. So don't feel as though you have to hoard information as a form of job security. But this is to help all of you grow. The company is growing. You plan to not just grow, but to actually scale. And you can't do that as long as the information resides in people's heads mm -hmm. and not on that proverbial paper. And, and but aside from that, Nana, as you know, if someone were to go on vacation, if someone, God forbid, gets sick and that person is out for an extended period, will the work stop just because those one or two key people aren't in the office? It shouldn't. Right. And one way to make sure that it, it won't stop is if you have things documented so that you can cross train other people to take over when someone else may have to may not be available to work at a certain time. One of the things you mentioned the word scale, and sometimes what I hear from business owners is, hey, I wanna stay small because you know when I scale, it means I need to go get more employees, right? But if, if you find a way to standardize the processes, then you won't have to worry about having to manage a lot more people, right? Uh, some people owners are like, well, I'm only comfortable up to eight employees. Or once you get to like 36 employees, it's it's too much. Or whatever you know the number is. How does this help? Number one, um, you know, reduce the concerns that owners may have about, hey, if I scale, that means my expenses are going to go up, and also I have to be able to manage more people, and therefore I don't want to do that. So we should probably distinguish the difference between growing versus scaling. And I'll define it from, from my point of view, from my vantage point as an operations person. When I talk about growth, it's usually the things that you're doing to actively promote the business. So all of the sales and marketing and business development related activities. What are you doing to bring more customers into the door? When I talk about scale, it's really from an operations perspective. How can you do more or the same with less or with the same resources, excuse me? That's what scale is all about. Just because you scale the volume of clients or customers or business or sales that's coming in, it doesn't necessarily mean that the rate of expenses has to scale with that. That's actually not scale. That's growth. Scale is when you are able to keep that, those, that same amount or same combination of resources that, that you have, and you're able to do even more business with those same resources. That's scale. So to answer your question more directly, you do eventually have to hire more people. But what I always recommend is that, as you pointed out, Nana, standardize those processes first. And oftentimes when you're standardizing, you're thinking of other ways of improving that process, whether it be via automation, this is where the tools and the technologies piece come into play. It could be that you need to upgrade a particular technology that will enable you all to process or get through those cycle times of your processes even faster. So always comb through and really analyze and pick apart your processes. In other words, the way that you do what you do. Really analyze that first, figure out how you can automate wherever possible, streamline wherever possible, remove as much waste as you can, focus on those value adding activities, and then you go hire additional people. Because it will happen eventually, you've, you've streamlined and you've leaned six sigma your processes to death <laughs> and of yeah. course there's always room for improvement 
but the business may still be coming in and you realize, okay, we have this core team of 15 people. We need, we need about 10 more people to handle the volume. Now, for those who are listening, if you are the owner CEO or the owner operator, it's at that point when you have to make a decision. Do you either want to stay on the technical path of your company and bring someone else in to be the true visionary, to truly function as the CEO, while you might maybe become the COO? Or if you say, no, I have what it takes to be a true CEO, a true strategic thinker, a true visionary for my company, and I can scale it to this next level, you have to bring some, you have to bring in a number two because everyone cannot keep coming to you, getting you bogged down in the day-to-day minutia of what it takes to run the business. You now need a COO to come in and handle that for you and serve as a liaison between you and maybe everyone else that's on your team. Oh, that's great. So do you think, uh, because a lot of times I like the board level and leadership meetings, you know, you talk about sales, sales and marketing is always talked about, you talk about people and the financials. Do you think operations get get enough respect um, when it comes to that at the C level and, and the boardroom level? No, it absolutely does not. And it's so unfortunate because operations is literally, I, I always use this, this I always use this expression, Nana, whenever I'm trying to get people to understand why operations is so important. Marketing is about making a promise to your customer. I promise that if you give me your money, I am going to provide you with X. Operations is about delivering on that promise. Sales and marketing can make promises all day long. They can promise customers the world. But at the end of the day, what really matters is can you deliver on what you promised? And that's what operations focuses on. I had a client many years ago who (laughs) she was on the operations side and she said something I'll never forget. And every time I think about it, I chuckle. She said, you know, sales sales and marketing they're busy out there selling the dream while us folks here in operations are busy dealing with the nightmare. So in other words, yeah. and there has, to be, right. there has to be, there has to be a unified front. Don't go out selling things and making promises that you know you can't keep. Think about how many times we've heard of the, the cases where people may have a viral moment whether it's they, they have the benefit of being on a popular TV show, they have a feature on a radio show, a newspaper article feature, whatever the case may be, social media, they have had a viral moment somewhere mm-hmm. out there in media. And now all of a sudden, there's all of this traffic going to their website and the website crashes because they did not have that operational or business infrastructure in place to be able to handle the surge in demand. This is what Nana and I are talking about. This is why operations matters because you can go out there all day long and spend so much time making yourself look attractive to potential customers. And, And it's important, don't get me wrong, you have to do that. But what happens when all of a sudden you go from processing 10 orders a day to 100 orders a day. Can you handle it? And if you can't, or if you think you're getting to that point where you might have a viral moment of some sort, you better get this business infrastructure in place. Yeah, I mean, you know, so many examples. And I know we, you know, we we kind of getting ready to wrap up. What are the biggest mistakes people make in their infrastructure? Oh gosh, one of the first mistakes is not not investing in it at all, not not taking it seriously and waiting too too long, waiting to put putting it off and putting it off and putting it off and not rolling up their sleeves and just getting the work done. I am not going to sugarcoat this. It is not for the faint at heart. It is not something that you can expect to do in 30 days and then put it on the shelf and look at it, you know, and, and think that it's it's well, I did it. 
and that it never has to be up, upgraded or updated or improved or changed. It evolves like everything else in your business. Another thing is not having the right mindset. It goes back to, for, for the founders that we're talking to right now, you will reach a point where you realize if you're being honest with yourself, either you're getting in the way of your own company's growth or you need to bring on that number two person. So those are some, some of the, the underlying causes behind when I see when things kind of go off the rails, Nana, regarding business infrastructure. Last thing, and then and that would be it. Um, so like when you walk the process, one of the things, because you had mentioned about the tension between marketing and operations, and a lot of times it has to do with alignment. Do you think like having one person own, like in other words, the org, the org structure sometimes causes this. Everybody is specialized. There's pros and cons between having the org structures where people are specialized versus having one owner and it's horizontal. So uh, one says you know, leader, and then marketing operations, everybody reports into that mm -hmm. versus having a CMO, a CEO, and everybody within their own little silos. We don't want silos. Right. We, we want to keep the structure as flat as possible because that encourages, that it discourages, I should say, bureaucracy. It discourages silos. But at some point you will reach, if you're growing, and you want to continue the growth and not just grow, but actually scale, you have to start adding in that middle layer of management. I mean, I'll, I'll use myself as an example. I had a meeting just this morning, Nana, with a, a company that I work with. I outsource, we outsource a great bit of our social media to this particular company. And I said, I need someone to step up to just serve as that liaison because I can't I'm at a point where I cannot get on Slack. We use Slack mm -hmm. for our ongoing day-to-day -day communications. And Slack is wonderful because you get to organize all of your conversations into these different channels. And I said, I can't, I'm just at a point now where I cannot have everyone coming to me, asking me, oh, do you approve this? Do you approve that, Alicia? Do you, do you, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? Or where can I find this? Where can I find that? I have to have someone who can serve as that liaison now. And so that's, I, I'm using myself as, right. as an example. I'm practicing what I preach. I'm at that point where, I, where I'm recognizing if I'm really going to take this to the next level, if Equilibria is now ready to go to the next level, I absolutely cannot get bogged down in the day-to-day -day decisions that are happening administratively, operationally, some of the, the little things here and there but in the aggregate it eats up a lot of your time time right. that you that time that i as the owner could be out there you know spending networking and forming strategic partnerships with other people like you nana and and going to lunches and business other business events and doing the public speaking all of those kinds of things oh, that is awesome well, thank you very much, Alicia. This was awesome. This kind of went back kind of fast, but I know uh, we need more time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll do a follow up. Obviously. Okay, we'll, good, we'll good. <laughs> thank so, you. Awesome. So, how do people, uh, you know, uh, get in touch with you or follow your work? Oh, wow. Uh, the best place, if you want to follow my company and and get in touch with us, find out a little bit more about what we do. Our website is EQB Systems dot com so the company is equilibria but we don't put that in our uh, url because it's uh, some people have difficulty spelling it so again it's eqbsystems.com and i'm always happy to connect with anyone who's listening to this right now on linkedin you can find me at alicia butler pierre awesome and we're going to have that information in the show notes so for people that are listening you can check out the show notes and alicia's information will be there as well well, thank you so much for joining us, Alicia, and uh, you know, I look forward to speaking with you again soon. Oh, thank you so much, Nana. This was fun.